is Reverend Reggie. I'll be the teacher this evening. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start to share my screen right away so that we can go ahead and get started. And tonight, I'll urge you all to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Last week, we came out of Luke uh, chapter 19. This week, we're gonna take a step back and we're gonna look at Luke chapter 18, um, verses 18 through 30. I'm not gonna read them all, so don't, don't worry. But we are going to focus on verses 28, 29, and 30 this evening. 28, 29, and 30. Um, so again, I will start off by just welcoming everybody to the Antioch Baptist Church of Springfield um, to our Wednesday night Bible study, amen. So glad you all decided to stop by and, and participate. Um, we, as usual, we will continue to, um, in the short and a brief prayer, we have already enjoyed a time of prayer and song scripture from the tailors thank them for that so let us let us bow father god we are so grateful for this hour this time of teaching lord we ask that you would open up our understanding open up our hearts lord help us just to receive what you have prepared for us this evening lord let it be edifying to the hearers father god and lord we ask that you would make our discussion robust Lord, and allow this word just to settle in our hearts, Lord, that we might consider your ways, our ways, Lord, and we ask that you would just continue to bless each and every person who is associated or affiliated with us and this church and all across our nation. It's in Christ Jesus, we pray, amen. So, um, so from... So we started a new teaching series, and this one is from Antioch Baptist Church to Infinity. And Pastor opened this up last week, and he introduced this new, this new theme. But the focus was last week is what does Jesus literally expect from us? That was the, the focus. So this is where we are going. Um, you know, part of what we have been looking at is assessing where we are um, and then recognize whether we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and can we do it better? So that's what last week was really about. And then um, when we hear God's voice to lead us um, to the next thing, are we actually doing it? So. Um, we want to make sure that we are, are doing what Christ asks us to do. And today we're going to really start off with a question, right? So tonight um, we're looking at, the again, the work of the church. And tonight's title is A Willing Sacrifice. A Willing Sacrifice. Are we willing sacrifices? And again, we are coming from the book of Luke, chapter 18, verses 18 through 30. And this is about the rich young ruler. And this is, I'll give you a brief background. Um, this was the young man who came to Christ and he says, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he was trying to figure this thing out um, and he knew who to go to to ask this question. And um, so Jesus presents to him the idea that he should keep all the law. So he says, oh, these, all of these things I've done for my birth, I, have, I don't kill, I don't steal, I don't you know, lie, I don't cheat, I don't, you know, he doesn't do any of those things. He says, I've kept them from a young age. And then Jesus turns to him, recognizing that he had much wealth, he says to him, fell all that you have, give it unto the poor, and then follow me. So again, tonight we're gonna to be taking a look at what is Jesus literally asking us to do? Was this just for him or was it for us or who was it for? 
right? So um, he, the young man, unfortunately, recognizing that he had much, he uh, sorrowfully walks away. Um, but then Jesus continues on to speak to his um, disciples that remain present. And he said to them, he says, and when Jesus saw, he became very sorrowful. He said, and this is going back to verse 24. He says, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, these things are impossible with men. He says, the, th the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So then he talks about a reward for self-sacrifice. And then these are the verses that we're going to focus on today. Then Peter said, remember, he was the, dis the disciples were among them at this time when this young man came and he wanted to be a disciple, but he didn't want to part with his wealth or his riches. He, Peter said, see, we have left all and followed you. Now, when all the disciples, of course, when we read through the, the gospels and the account of Christ, and when he called all of them, he just simply told them, follow me. They dropped everything, including their, their livelihoods, and they followed Christ. Um, so, Peter is reminding Jesus that that's exactly what they had done. So now he's pretty, he's pretty, he's pretty um, sure of himself, it sounds. And he says, and he said unto them, verily I say unto you, he being Jesus, Jesus now responds to that statement. He says, verily I say unto you, there is no man that have left house or parents or brethren or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. So it ends on actually a very, very good note. But one of the things that we want to talk about today is um, what is God asking us to do? So is God asking us to leave our house, our parents, our brethren, our wife, our children for the sake of God's kingdom? And if that's the case, how do we reconcile that in today's time? So let's just take a, a quick look. So. Um, basically, what I've done is try this. Now, I, I will I will say this is the way it it came to me. So, uh, if if you have a different understanding, we'll discuss we'll discuss that as we go through the lesson. But um, there was five. We were we're going to talk about those five different things: a house and what it represents, parents and what it represents, brethren, what it represents, wife and children, and what each represents, and what we can expect. So let's go forward. All right. So is Jesus asking us, literally asking us to abandon, abandon it all? Uh, my wife's hand is up already. <laughs> I would say that um, even if he's not asking us to literally give up everything, um, he is asking us to at least, at the very least, be willing to give up everything for his sake, I think. Be willing to give it all away. Mm -hmm. And here, as you see, that I have the hand of giving it all away. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's take a deeper look at that. And let's see what this could mean for us. So when we look at what he says, um, to give, he says, abandon the house. House represents, according to my understanding, a safety, right? 
So having a home or shelter gives us protection from the elements and would be intruders. Uh, would it, without it, we feel exposed and vulnerable. Thus our house is a place of peace, comfort and refuge, safety. But the question is, is Jesus's desire for us to be homeless? When we look at the disciples, they all simply walked away. Does he literally, is he literally telling us that we need to walk away from our homes? And remember this in the backdrop of where we've come from. We talked about the, the early church and some of them literally sold their homes and then they shared to, with all the rest that they would not have any lack, that they would not be without. And they distributed all that they had to others. Today, we want to ask that question. Is Jesus's desire for us to be homeless or wanderers in this earth? Or what is he asking us for? Any, 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 any thoughts there? Because ultimately, it's the, it's the safety issue, right? Go ahead, my wife. Oh. <laughs> um, I would, again, just say that um, he probably wants us to be willing to give these things up. And if we are in a position to help someone else, um, even in a way that we may feel maybe um, kind of detrimental to ourselves, that we should be willing to go the extra mile to help that other person as well. And that's what the early church did. They gave up their earthly possessions just to be a help to the others who were in the faith. You know, and the difficulty is that when some of these things we do, like the rich ruler, we find security in, right? We find assurance in. And this is some of the things, this, so this is where sometimes the challenge comes in. Now, is he literally asking us to, to give up our home? If we, when we compare scripture, we have to remain constant in scripture to make sure that we compare scripture to scripture. Jesus doesn't say anything to contradict himself. The scripture doesn't contradict itself. So we have to look at it in totality. So in this case, is, is, is that what he's asking of us today? Um, so I see another hand is raised. Deacon? Yeah, hi. Um, okay, Sister Carol? Um, if anything gets in the way of us ultimately doing the will of God, then we have to lay, basically, I know it's not saying lay it aside, because he said that he would supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So as you say, he doesn't contradict his word. But if your house is going to take precedence over uh, what he desires of us, then we have to we have to deny it until we get to the place where we are putting God first in all that we do. Right. And so and I again, the the house in this case to me it represents a place of safety. Again, a place of refuge. So when we look at so when we look at some other scriptures, um, like. Uh, Psalm 91 verses one and two, it says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the almighty. He said, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So God gives us another, he gives us another type of assurance that that our safety doesn't, again, lie in our, our home. Just because we lock a door doesn't mean that we're always secure. We see tornadoes and floods have proven that, even the forest fires or, or even um, ants and, and termites that come and they destroy these things that are earthly. But we have a treasure in heaven. We have a place that Christ says he has already gone to prepare for us. So our safety doesn't uh, lie in the things that are here, again, like our home that he's asking us to give up. These things lie in the fact that we can trust in God. 
So no, he's not calling us to, to necessarily give up a home. And for some, he may. The truth is there's some that they get a message directly from the Lord. And he says, go and be sojourners in this world that you're going to start a mission. And that's what your life is going to be. And he calls them out of the, the safety of their home or whatever we, we see. And they, and they travel the earth and they're calling souls to discipleship, you know, calling people to salvation. So um, in, Psalm, in Psalm 4 and 8, he says, in peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you, you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. So we know that we can find safety in Christ Jesus. We can find safety in God. And it just doesn't always depend on us finding safety in the things that are, are more natural to us. Um, let's, let's move on. Um, our parents, does he says, or parents, for those who have given up their parents. So do, what, is, what is he saying here? So what I see parents as a form of security. Like, like money, parents offer us a reasonable amount of security. Again, when we think about this in context of the rich young ruler, this young man, he put his trust in money. And he couldn't easily walk away from it because he had a lot of it. <laughs> and that can be troublesome for us when we, when we put all of our security in the things, again, that are of this world that will perish. It, uh, I wrote, primarily all our needs are met by our parents. Food, clothing, and shelter are generally provided by them. As a result, we depend on them for our sustenance and trust them with our lives. They also tend to love us more than anyone else, even if we uh, are, 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 are not a, a, a cool kid. I always say good children make good parents, right? Um, which gives us further assurance. But um, but the question is, does Jesus want me to forsake my parents? Is he telling me this to turn away? And we see in cases where Jesus says, don't even, don't even go back. Don't, don't, you know, let the dead bury the dead. My, I want to say goodbye to my parents. He said, no, no, let's, let's cut and go. We got some business to take care of. But today, is that what he's calling us for? Again, we find security in those who are our provider. But one of the things, Deacon Taylor. Hello? Yes, we hear you. Oh, okay. I didn't know what you were saying. But if we're, didn't they say that the children should honor their mother and father? Amen. So are we creating a contradiction if we think that? Right. So, yeah, again, and when we when we listen to that, is it dishonoring them to, to abandon them? Now, th I think when we think about it, the expectation is that one day we are going to leave our parents. We can't stay home forever. So we have to step, be able to step out. And one day we will breach the doors of the house and go out on our own prayerfully if the parents don't kick us out like the little birds in the nest. Sometimes um, you got to push them out. Sometimes you got to push them out <laughs> because, again, that's where we find security. And in finding our security in um, our parents, sometimes we don't want to break away from them. But, you know, God says he offers us um, security and all of our needs that are met through him. Um, Matthew 6 and 33 says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. So the, all of the things that are needful for the body, for our sustenance, God says, all you have to do is first, you have to seek me. Seek me and I will provide all of those things for you. Um, Psalm 23 and 1 we, is one of my favorite scriptures. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As long as we are led by God, by Christ himself, if we are led by God, then he's going to lead us 
to those still waters, those green pastures. He's going to um, provide the security that we need. All of our needs are going to be met by him. Right. And and more famously is uh, Hebrews 13, 5 the, um, B, I would say the second half. He says, be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. So we, we, we have to understand that God is our provider. All good and perfect gifts come from above that we can find security in him, you know, and we don't have, so, so these, this, what I believe it, it, the, those parents are representing what we're walking, you know, away from. Um, next, our brethren, which represents our friendships or relationships, also our identity. Um, so, um, what I wrote is being a loner is generally regarded as odd. You know, our natural tendency is to see how or where we fit in. Having a friend or friends offers us a sense of belonging and communal standing. Sometimes we place great value on these relationships because without others, we feel lost or alone because our identity is often tied to these relationships. So just even like with our, 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 our mother and father, again, it's eventually expected that we're gonna break apart. From them. But then we have other relationships which might be long lasting. Our brethren could literally be our brother, or our sister, you know, um, but um, it also could mean those who are, in our community, our friends, those we've grown up with. But they offer us a sense, sometimes we get a sense of who we are as being a part of a larger group. But here we have to ask the question. So if, if these are my good friends, how can Jesus ask me to walk away from them and my family? Is that what he's asking me to do? Do you think that's what he's asking us to do? Just simply just walk away from those family and those friends. Actually, in some cases, he actually is. <laughs> we know that the Bible teaches us that uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, 15 and 33, it says, evil communication corrupts good character. So sometimes we, we literally do have to step away. And we know that Christ is, is enmity, has enmity with the world. There's no identification with Christ in the world. The, the world hated Christ, so therefore it's going to hate us. And generally, as people who are believers, if we are true believers, it, especially if our friends and our family are not, then sometimes we can be called to step away from them. In 2 Corinthians 6 and 14, it says that we shouldn't be unequally yoked. Light and darkness have no fellowship. So we have to, as, as new believers in Christ, our faith should drive us to either become part of a fellowship that we're other believers, or perhaps we might have to step away from our, our family or friends who may not believe the way that God is um, prescribing. And Deacon Gordon? Yeah, I, I, I was just going to say sometimes uh, people in your life are there just for a season, okay? They're not there forever. Uh, some, they, they, you know, you can learn some things from them and there come a point where you may grow into different directions, I should say, you know? Mm -hmm. So that case, you have to walk away. Right. You know, and, it, and sometimes these things can be extremely difficult for us. They can be difficult for us because again, um, we value relationship. Again, we, you know, we might, we might feel um, out of place when we are not um, in, that, in that group with our, our associates, um, our comrades. Uh, Alicia? But what about someone who might say, what hope is there for my family and my friends if I have to separate from them and then I don't have the opportunity to 
um, you know, give, give them the good news and witness to them and share my testimony with them if I'm suffering from them. Right. Well, absolutely. I would say, I would say definitely we always have to be the light in the earth that, that Christ has put us here to be. He says we don't hide our light. Um, so we want to make sure we continue to do the good that he's placed us here to do. We want to reach out to others. We always want to make sure that we are actually forwarding the gospel. You know, these are part of the, the, the literal things like we're talking about that God is asking us to do. You know, I mean, for us though, we, you know, all, all of those old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are new creatures in Christ and we do have to sometimes separate, you know, at the same time, we do, he, he, he gives us, a, we, we, we're given a new hope, a, a new spirit of adoption, that we're going to be drawn into a new family with him. You know, Ephesians 1 and 5 says, he has chosen us, you know, predestined us unto the adoption of children with Christ Jesus. So we become joint heirs with his son. So now we're adopted into a new family. So we have a, still have a sense of belonging. We don't feel like we're, we're out there on our own. We're not alone in this world. But God, instead, he is prepared, he is prepared to bring us into the fold. Um, that's why even as when we, when we look at the law and those who were um, the chosen, you know, we, we, can, we as Gentiles can, can feel uh, very good and secure about the fact that now we are um, as as part of God's family, you know, so we 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 are not cast away. We're not we're not um, by simply again by ourselves, and we have a new identity, a new identity in Christ Jesus, and He is constantly forming us and shaping us, and do, and the Word is constantly um, working on us. All right. So so um, I do see in the chat. Oh, it says, I just think it is difficult because it's hard for people to know when to separate and when to suffer with their friends and family for hope of leading them to salvation. Absolutely. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, there's, there's some that, that, won't, that won't bear to hear the word. And that'll, that'll just be, you know, the truth. I mean, and it's kind of sad to say, but... Um, it's like they're gonna put stoppers in their ears, so to speak. You know, they don't wanna hear that word. So, but then he says, he goes on, he says, the wife or wife. Um, and since again, he's talking to his disciples and we know Peter himself had a wife because they talked about Jesus healing the mother-in-law, right? So we know he, he, he is taking a sabbatical from his wife. You know, and we find that love is the most coveted human emotion. You know, um, presumably we all long for something to care deeply about and will search years or even a lifetime looking for it. And finding a wife, a good thing, a man has finally discovered that passion and completed the hunt. But what, what it really is, is, He's telling us to perhaps that there's times we're going to have to walk away from the things that we love. So could Jesus really be asking us to give up on love's pursuit? And we can love a lot of things. In this case, again, looking back at the rich young ruler, we know that the love of money is the root of all evil. This guy, he cherished his money more than he cherished everlasting life. This is what he went to Christ looking for. It was more valuable for him to keep the things that were earthly than to find what was not perishable, what was going to be eternal. He decided that it was better for him to maintain what he already had than to follow Christ, to give it all away and just follow him. And sometimes for us, there are other pursuits 
that we have. We talked last week, and I and I one of the things I made in a comment was priority. What do we prioritize greater than God? You know, and when we do, do have pro now, we all have responsibilities, and there are things that we do in our life that we love to do. My wife is a writer; she loves it. You know, I can I I it's just oozing out her pores. You know, it's what she she was born to do. But should she love? Should she love writing more than she loves Christ? What I see that she does, she segues, she put it all together. She writes about the love that she has for God. <laughs> you know, she does all of these things. You know, she uses her gifts in, in order to, as an expression of that love. But when we, that's, but what happens when we walking away from that love that we have, are we to abandon that love? You know, um, but we, we see that God says, you know what? But you wouldn't even know love if I hadn't first shown you love. So God is love. And we can learn that in First, first John. God is love. Um, John 3, 16, we, we recognize that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God is saying, you know what? You're not, don't be afraid to step away to do the things that I've called you to do because you have a fear of loss of love. Because I am love. I'm the embodiment of love. He says, I've sent my son to sacrifice him and his life out of an act of love for you. And we know that even yet while we were sinners, God did what? He commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, he gave his son to die for us. So we find, again, we find reassurance in the fact that God has sufficient love for us. And all of those things, um, 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 Paul said he counted everything that he had done in the past. He counted it, all of those accolades, all those things of acclaim. He said, I counted all as dumb for the sake that I should win Christ, that he should be, be Christ-like. So, I mean, sometimes it does, these things do come at somewhat of a sacrifice, but God is more than more than apt and prepared to substitute all of these things to give us all, every, everything that we need in the pursuit of what he's called us to do. And so this young man, unfortunately, he found more of a desire and love in his, his, his money. Um, and I know we're running close and this is gonna be one of our last slides. So then he says, and our children. And sometimes we can love our children we, more than our parent, more than our wife. That's not the natural order of things according to the scripture. Um, but our children represent our legacy, right? So as our legacy, we know that um, we have, and an, um, it's, it's almost like a proof of our existence. Um, I hear this a lot from one of my sons. He just wants to make his mark on this earth. Um, for most children, their legacy, their, for most children is their legacy or mark on this earth. Having lots of children in many cultures is a sign of wealth and virility. Children, especially sons, establish or maintain our presence in the world by keeping our name and our memory alive. The truth is, it's, none of us really want to, you know, be eradicated from the world. We know that we all will have to die one day, but we want to have a legacy. You know, we want our name to be carried on in this, in this earth. Um, Psalms uh, 127 and 3, it says, behold, children are a gift from the Lord. So we know that our children are a gift from the Lord. And again, we want to make sure that we look at the scripture and compare. So would Christ tell us now that we shouldn't uh, take care of our children or we should abandon them? He says a man is considered worse than an infidel if he doesn't uh, care for his children, his family. Worse than an infidel. One who cheats and, you know. So we, we look at the scripture and we understand 
that should, that um, our legacy is something that can be very important to us. And we can put, we can put that sometimes above God, you know? So is he really telling us to walk away from our children? I don't believe so. He says, um, and in, 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 in effect, try to establish good, a good name. He said, Proverbs 22 and one, it says, a good name is to be more desired than great wealth. So God tells us, yeah, we should have a good name. He wants us to have both favor with God and men. He wants us to have favor between us both. However, he wants, he's going to provide for us a legacy. Amen? He's going to um, provide us um, a place that is going to be everlasting. What the rich young ruler came to him to see or to gain really was that everlasting life. So God has given us, he gives us a promise to establish us an everlasting name. You know, he says our name, our mark, it's going to be in our forehead. He's going to give us a, a, a name that is written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, and, and nobody can er erase that out but God. And if he's established it or written it, I'm sure, I don't know if he got to erase it. You know what I mean? If he put it there, I think it's going to stay. So, I mean, I, I pray that my name is written, your name is written, you know, and that's our true legacy. And, our, and another legacy is not just our children, but like my wife just questioned, you know, is all of those that we help disciple in this earth today, all of those that we tell the good news to, all those that we do good unto, that Christ and God has put in our path to already do, the ones that are going to hear this message and are going to forward it, and it's going to continue to proliferate in this world 30, 60, 100 fold, like, a, like the seed sower. So we want to continue to plant in good ground, and we want our legacy to continue that you know, it's going to show in heaven our good works because one day that's going to be tallied up by God. He, our good works shall follow us in the everlasting. God is going to look at that and he's going to know what we've been laboring in in this earth. So we need to continue to hear his voice, to continue to do the things that he's called us to do and not, and, and ultimately, ultimately, have greater trust and greater faith in him that whatever work that he started in us, that good work, that he will help to see it through to its completion. So, and, and one of the things that pastor reminded us of last week is that it all still comes with a promise that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be a reward. And so what is the reward? And verse 30, again, I'll just re reiterate it. He says, who shall not receive, uh, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time? Today, he's, he's promising us today that we are going to receive much, much more um, than, what, than even what we're giving out. And in the world to come, life everlasting. That is the reward that is the promise that Christ has given us in this scripture. So again, I know I saw the time sign and we want to be, we want to be faithful in that. Um, I just thank you all. This, this was kind of fun for me. Um, this is the way the Lord presented it to me. So I have to give it the way he gave it. I pray that it was a blessing to you all tonight. Um, and uh, I will stop. Uh, sharing my screen just so we can each see each other. But I'm so uh, grateful for this opportunity just to come before you and, and teach this lesson. And I see you, Pastor. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, I will go ahead and close with prayer if there's any other comment. All right. So let us let us seek the Lord. Father God, we are so grateful for this time of study. We thank you for all those who have joined us, who have chosen to remain online. 
Lord, on the, on the prayer line. We ask that you would just continue to bless each and every one of them, Father God. Lord, we ask that you would enrich them with your word. Allow them to go back and continue to study. Even here in, in, in Luke 18, Father God, give them greater clarity and understanding, for, Father God. Reveal your wisdom unto each and every one of us, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you would just bless all those who are working in the background, Lord, just to make this production um, uh, available to all those who would, who would come along and see it. Lord, we ask that you would just give us a heart just to trust in you more. Father God, just not to lean on all those um, temporary things in this earth, Lord, but to find the faith and the courage to step out, Lord, when you have called us. Lord, not to abandon all those things that we, we know, Lord, but just to rely more more upon you, Father God, for all of our sustenance, for all of our, our safety, our concerns, Lord, for, for the love that you uh, have for us, Lord. So we just thank you. We praise you, Lord, and we ask that you would, again, continue to prosper the Antioch Baptist Church of Springfield, Father God, all who do on its doors. And, and Lord, we ask that you would give them a ready word and a, and a spirit to go forth and do your will, Lord, that they would submit first themselves unto you, Lord, and then to serve others as you have proclaimed in your word. Lord, and we ask for a sweet sleep this night. Give us rest and peace, Lord, as we slumber, Lord, knowing that you are always in watchful care above, above us, Father God. And it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.